Liz Truss. I mean, who would have believed that Liz Truss could become Prime Minister? But she did. And a couple of bright sparks. Harry Cole from The Sun and James Heal, who joins me now from The Spectator. And I heard quite early on they were doing a Truss biography. And the title they chose, absolutely brilliant, out of the blue. I thought, really good, because it just works at every level. And I thought, James, welcome, by the way, to the programme. <laughs> I thought, well, this is going to be an absolute winner. You know, you're on this, nobody else is. Um, 45 days and she was gone. How's the book doing? It's doing all right, thank is you. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and timely as well, because, um, you know, after a bit of time away from the spotlight, um, you know, last night there was a meeting of this new group, which uh, Liz is involved with. Well, that's right. I said, so, 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 you know, I was thinking, well, 45 days, she's gone. She mm. turned up at the cenotaph. She's been pretty quiet. Mm. She's, I mean, personally been through a pretty humiliating yeah. and, 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 you know, what if you think about politics? Mm. It's been very tough for her. So just... Tell us what happened last night. Sure. Um, so I think you're right, as you say, that, you know, after 10 years in government, um, had not had a holiday when she wasn't a minister for 10 years. There was mm. a sort of period out in the sun. Yeah. And then yesterday, Parliament's now back. And there was a, a launch, a quite low key launch of the Conservative Growth Group with uh, some of her key supporters. The growth Group. Exactly. Um, because I think there's a bit of concern, which is that after Rishi Sunak take, took over, there's been less of an emphasis on economic growth and more about balancing the books. So this is a group of around 40 or so MPs who want to kind of keep that flame going and also try and get some policies which are going to stimulate the economy ahead of the next election. What you don't mean they believe in low taxes <laughs> at a small state. Depends who you ask, I'd say, Nigel. I think that it's going to be very interesting to see how the group operates coming up to the budget in March. Who are the significant players in the group? In the group, uh, Ranil Jayawadhana and Simon Clark, who are both uh, cabinet ministers yep. under trust. Yep. Um, and I think this itself hasn't got a formal position within the group, but it's part of a sort of wider series of initiatives. Um, Simon Clark is also launching the Next Gen Tories, which is about how we can win over the under 40, how the party can win over under 40s. Uh, things on childcare, planning, deregulation, etc., like that. Um, so it's part of a sort of wider moving picture. And of course, you then got Boris Johnson as well. And last week well, he was yeah, there. Well, yeah, I'm going to come to him in a second. But just, just, just a sort of final thought on trust, if mm. I may, on our own. So is a think tank that emphasises growth, is this in a sense her legacy? I wouldn't say it's a think tank, it's more a pressure group. Okay. And I think that this is because you've got a majority of 70 or so in Parliament, but of course, as you've seen, Rishi Sunak is willing to kind of back down on certain things. And you saw that in the space yeah. of 48 hours, I think, uh, at the end of last year, when they had the U-turn on planning targets and then the U-turn on onshore wind, which uh, met due to an amendment which both Boris Johnson yeah. and Liz Truss signed. And I think that shows that if you get a group together, you can sort of, it's a, it's a party of interests and certain different factions are moving in certain ways. And I think the hope is you can get a kind of growth, a pro-growth faction, if you will, that that's going to kind of push Rishi Sunak and the government to doing more pro-growth policies. Now, obviously, the point of Rishi Sunak was to bring stability. Mm. I mean, as I see it, stability and policy failure. But never mind, yeah, things are calmer than they were. Mm. And yet, you've got the Boris mm. faction setting up their new conservative democratic organisation, Lord Cruddus with a big cheque book behind it, looking for quite sort of almost Tony Bennite mm. type changes within the conservative. And Boris, for many, not as many as it was, but for many, is, you know, sort of, it's rather like the Jacobites. It's drinking the toast. It's the king across the water. And they believe that Boris can come back and lead them to great mm. success. But it is interesting that there is a Trussite group mm. as well who believe the party has become, you know, too high tax, too big state. Um, and then you've got the Rishiites. Mm. So the point of Rishi was to unite the party. Am I... Am I wrong to think there are now three separate camps of MPs? I think that the word is overcorrection that's used. And so the danger, I think, that some of the sort of trussides and sort of Johnsonites fear is that there was a kind of overcorrection after when Rishi Sunak came in and they said, OK, well, we've stabilised everything, the markets have calmed down, but we've gone too far into a kind of soft consensus and not actually challenging some vested interests on these things. I think that what is clear is that the Boris Johnson faction is more personal. I think people like Nadine Dorries just want their man back, as it were. It's Regardless of anything. It, yeah, basically, that's it. Yeah. Um, whereas I think the trussides is more about policy. And I think, in fairness, they're trying to say that, you know, stuff like the Conservative uh, Growth Group isn't about, you know, being anti-Sunak, etc. But, of course, it then comes down to votes in Parliament, etc., like that. So one can well, read these things. We can, one can read these well, things. Well, it may not be anti-Sunak, but it's probably anti-Jeremy Hunt. 
well, that might, well, we'll see that and coming up to the budget, you know, with those, I think already there's a report today in some of the press that there's going to be no tax cuts in that. Well, that's not obviously what some, you know, within the party would like. And that's why, that's not why they consider themselves to be conservatives. I mean, I did an interview uh, two weeks ago with Simon Clark and he said, you know, I am not a conservative. I'm a Thatcherite. That's what this last year has taught me. Yeah. And that is a really interesting kind of the debates within <coughs> yeah. the party about yeah. what should the party stand for? Who should they be campaigning for? And, and how bizarre, getting back to this book, <laughs> how did this woman who had always been centre, centre left. And, well, I mean, an active... Oh, before, before... Well, no, no, but thinking about her growing up and into yeah. adulthood and university. Yes. You know, she'd been an active Liberal Democrat. She'd wanted to get rid of the Queen. First Lib Dem Prime Minister. You know, you know, I mean, well... And suddenly, from being a Remainer, where did this Damascene conversion come from? I think all politicians have it to a certain extent in, in parties, but I think also a pragmatism and ability to survive um, and a kind of ambition and drive, which I think sets her apart. She was able to do the long hours, do the kind of travelling for trade, and that's what really, I think, sold her to a lot of people. Um, and I think it was a party that sort of, it was her or Rishi, there were some Johnsonites who'd never get over that fact, so they put their faction behind her, and that really was a kind of key difference in that leadership contest. You're there at The Spectator. Yep. You know, a, a magazine that tries to move the boundaries of debate in terms of conservative thinking. And I know, you're, you know, you, you're not the editor, but do the spectator think the Tories have even half a chance at the next election? I think it's going to be difficult. Uh, the fundamentals, you look at interest rates going up, you look at how that's going to affect votes. You see, you know, 15, 20 point Labour leads in the polls. Um, I think the danger is that the mini budget might have been a bit of a Black Wednesday moment, you know, a bit where it crystallised and voters move, uh, uh, um, minds, the mood has changed and they think that actually Labour could be more credible with these things. It'll be a tough road. There's some if you speak to around Rishi Sunak, the number 10, who think there's a way to do it. I think those five promises he said are possible, uh, but he's going to be a long road to see. So we will wait and see with interest to see if you can pull it off. Well, you know, 10 years ago, well, more than that, but, you know, exactly 10 years ago, I was leading a UKIP insurgency against a Conservative Party that didn't feel very Conservative. Mm -hmm. They, for example, brought in gay marriage without even having a manifesto commitment to do it. One very clear example, they'd gone mad for wind energy, um, onshore wind at the time, uh, not very popular, not really promised in the manifesto. And there was a UKIP insurgency that frightened the life out of the mm. Conservatives and forced Cameron into offering a referendum that he never, he never ever wanted to do that, you know, for obvious reasons. Now, reform at the moment, and I'm, I'm, I'm the honorary president, I'm not actively involved. There is another, there is, a, there is another insurgency building, mm. isn't there? I think that it's, if you get 6 to 7% of the polls, which they're currently on, that is going to harm the Conservatives more than it is Labour. And that's going to be very interesting compared to, say, 2019, when, of course, the Brexit party stood down. I think there is a sense of, the Conservative activists, there's certainly a sense of anger among some, and I think that could be damaging to the party. Maybe not so now, in the next year or so, but in opposition, that would be very interesting. And I think the first kind of post-Sunak leadership election would be very interesting to see what happens there. And likely, I guess, that the general election doesn't happen until we run towards the end of 2024. I think that's the assumption that most are operating on, yes. I think it's very difficult to see. If you look at those promises he set out, you know, inflation coming down, he needs years to achieve that. You want the small boats crisis to deal with as well. I think time is what He's they're going to need. He's not going to deal with that, is he? We, I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see. I think it's more small piece measures. I think the Rwanda scheme, for instance, which I think we've discussed about on this programme yeah. before, clearly is, you know, not going to work in the way that yeah. it was promised as a silver bullet by Boris Johnson. But I think that if... It depends, obviously, how the politicians spin things in terms of... He has promised... Them. And it's there on the Conservative Party manifesto, a, a, a website rather, mm. stop the boats. Not stop some of the boats. Well, this was the thing. Stop at, the boats. And that press conference and, he, and putting the figure on it is obviously, there's the headline figure and then it's like, when will you claim victory, etc. with which policy? Um, so we will see how, how whether it will be enough for you, Nigel, or... Be well, we'll trade. have to see. Final thought, yeah. James Heal. Are there any Prince Harry style revelations in here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some fun stuff, I'll say, from uh, from various bits of Liz's career. Um, the DIT year stands a quite a good wild, wild ride, but uh, nothing about Elizabeth Arden cream. I'll say that. Okay, thank goodness for that, James Hill. Thank you, thank you very much, and Liz Truss looking for her political legacy. We'll take a short break. <laughs> 